Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we reached another text in our uh, lectionary this week where we're going on a roll where we hear a lot of harsh things and we have to say, this is the gospel of the Lord. And then we get to the parable of the prodigal son and say, yes, this feels more like gospel. And then this week we get to things that feel like law. And we have to say, this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. But that doesn't mean that we can't learn some things here. In fact, there's a lot going on in the world right now, and I feel like it's been redundant in keeping on saying that. There's so much going on. There's so much turmoil. There's so much chaos. But it's true. And actually, if it wasn't manifesting itself in the blatant ways that it is right now, it would be still under the surface. And in some ways more insidious and more... I don't know, tricky to get around, but right now, you know, there's there's always catechesis going on. And now we use that term in the church uh, specifically to mean teaching, right? That it comes from a Greek word um, katekeo, which means to speak back. Which is why a lot of times in confirmation or in teaching the catechism, we have the kids speak. We say one thing, and they say it again, you know, so we say, I believe, I believe in God the Father Almighty, and God the Father Almighty, you know, back and forth, back and forth. There's always catechesis going on, this confessing back and forth, whether it's here in church, or whether it's out in the world. There's always something that someone is trying to teach you, to ingrain, to instill. And with that, there are certain ways that we can read the gospel text that seem very harsh. Ways that the world would want us to read these things. There are misconceptions that go along with this, and we hear it a certain way, and we hear it repeated back to us by certain people, even people who claim to be Christians, in such a way that just doesn't really sound right. We can't really put our finger on why. So it's important to go through these things. We hear Jesus say, Be merciful, even as your Father is, is, uh, even as your Father is, is uh, merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Now let's just stop there, because that's typically where people tip, usually stop in repeating this passage. Be merciful, judge not, condemn not. Everything's okay, right? Just let it slide. It's not worth the hassle. It's not worth the pain to call things out, right? Yet we as Christians, we hear this and we say, it doesn't really sound, you're missing something. I'm missing something here. And that's because we as Christians have as our teacher Christ. And he's not only our teacher, he's our Savior. That through him, we are made new creations. That through the waters of baptism and his holy word, we are made new creations. And in this world, there's a lot of darkness and despair. But God's word is that light that guides us on our path. And we are... And we are... Uh, and we are enlightened by his word, and we follow Christ as the ultimate authority on life and salvation. And without this understanding, we can't get the full understanding of this text from Luke 6. Because without this, we would hear on one side, well, let's just go through what this doesn't mean and what this does mean. We'll have a little bit of Bible study here right now because, well, we're not really having Bible study formally. So, typically, actually, uh, during the Reformation, that's all a sermon was. 
It was expounding on the text. So let's do a little bit of that. So what doesn't this mean, right? Judge not, condemn not. It doesn't mean that anything goes. How often do you hear someone say, it's like, well, you know, they're, they're doing some things I wouldn't really approve of, but, you know, judge not, condemn not, right? That's not what this means, that anything goes. It also doesn't mean that we should just go along to get along. Well, you know, kind of going about things backwards by living together before getting married, but hey, you know what, judge not, condemn not. It doesn't mean that we also shouldn't call out any sin for any reason ever, because then you'd be the hypocrite. That's not what this means. It also doesn't mean that these are if-then statements. If you don't judge, then God won't judge you. If you don't condemn, then God won't condemn you. That's not what this means. These things that this doesn't mean are usually, in a broad sense, used to excuse sin, either of ourselves or other people. Or to avoid the trouble and pain that come as a result of calling the sin out. Not, this is very important, not as a result of making ourselves feel better. Or to bring someone else down. But for the reason that they would understand the depths of their sin. And understand the depths of the, of the forgiveness of Christ as a result. That's something we definitely cannot separate from this understanding. So we've talked about what this doesn't mean. So what does this mean? Be merciful, judge not, condemn not. It means that we cannot condemn somebody. We literally cannot damn someone whom Jesus has died for. That is not our place. That is not what we do when we call out sin. This does mean that you ought to repent of your own sin before calling someone else to, to repentance. It does mean that we should not refuse, that we should not refuse to, to grant forgiveness to someone that is truly that is truly repentant. And it also means that we shouldn't refuse to turn away from our sin, to to excuse me, to to repent when rightly called out for it does mean that true mercy can only be shown because, because God's mercy is first shown to us in Christ. We can't look at these things as separated from the person who actually said them, as if they're, they are a good moral law, but the perfect law shows us how sinful we really are. How many of you can say, oh, I never judge people? Not even secretly. Not even quietly to myself. You can say that, come on. Let's be real. What about condemning people? I don't think anybody is, uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody can, can be uh, truthful in saying that I never condemn somebody, I've never judged somebody at all, for whatever reason. So we're all guilty of this. But this is what it means to be a Christian. To see these things. To come together as imperfect people. Worse than that, as sinners. To sin against each other. But, because God has granted us His grace, we can forgive, we can repent, 
we can make things right because it has been made right through Christ. This is bearing with each other in this dark and sinful world and calling to and calling to repentance out of love and not holding back the forgiveness where it's asked for. Because we have to keep in mind that the, the refusal to, to forgive is just as damning as the, as the, as the refusal to repent. That if we don't forgive someone who is asking for it, that is harboring hatred. It kills faith, ultimately. And in refusing to turn away from our sin by saying, eh, you know, it doesn't seem that bad to me. Why do I need to repent of this? Everybody does it. That kills faith. But doing these things, coming together in love and truth, it's hard to speak the word of God in truth and purity means that we will be despised by this world. In fact, we are already under attack in many ways from outside this, from outside the church and from and from me, and from within from false Christians. Again, it's not my place to say who is and who isn't. God knows these things. But it is my place to say as the pastor, when you read these things, say, judge not, condemn not. No. What does that mean for my job? What does that mean for your duty as a Christian? There are things that must be called out. And these things naturally bring suffering. It's not easy. But, as Paul writes in our epistle for today from Romans chapter 8, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be, that is to be revealed to us. Satan means for the trials, tribulations, persecutions, and general suffering. He means these things for evil. He means for these things to pull us away from God's love. He means for these things to cause, to cause us to despair or become prideful. But God means these things for good. How can this be? Well, to put things in perspective, we see from our from our Old Testament text from Genesis, Joseph is a foreshadowing of Christ in some ways. He is all by all accounts he's blameless, at least outwardly. Yet his brothers hate him. They throw him in, um, they throw him into a pit. They're going to kill him, but. God brings him into slavery, which saves his life, and some may think, how is that good? But he works his way up, and by being pious and faithful to God, he is brought up through the ranks, but only to be cast down again by false accusations, right? It's up and down, up and down with Joseph, but in the end, he's blessed. And his brothers, they still have that guilty conscience, right? And, they, and when Joseph... And when Jacob dies, they're still asking for forgiveness. He says, as for you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That in these sufferings, in this present time of chaos and turmoil, we find ourselves asking why. What's the point? What's the point of all this craziness going on? I mean, we don't necessarily encounter it here in Fredericksburg. We actually have a nice town here in the surrounding area. We're not in danger of riots 
or uh, violent demonstrations or things like that. But elsewhere, these things are going on and we feel it. We can just naturally look out in the world and see something's not right. We have, to, we have to keep in mind, though, that in terms of the turmoil and the suffering that goes on in this world, put that in view of Christ. That with Jesus, we have to keep in mind that Pilate, Caiaphas, the Pharisees and the scribes, in condemning him to death, didn't mean it for good. They meant it for evil. But ultimately, in the crucifixion of Christ, in the suffering and death that he endured for your sake, it was for your good. With all these things in mind, how God uses these things to burn away all of the things that don't matter in this life. All of the things that are nice to have, that are blessings from God. The food, the shelter, the comfort that we have. In terms of affliction and trials, these things pale in comparison. We see these are nothing in comparison to the glory that is won through Christ. That is the point of suffering. That Jesus says, whoever desires to come after me must pick up his cross and follow me daily. Right? In fact, even here in Luke 6, he says, a disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will, will be like his teacher. That if Jesus Christ, our teacher, more than that, he's our Savior, but he's also our teacher. If our teacher, in all things, suffered persecution and death, why should we think that we would get any less? But it doesn't mean that we are by ourselves. It doesn't mean that God leaves us alone in our suffering, whatever that may be. But he is, he's there. He is in the midst of our suffering with us. And we all have our sufferings, right? We all have our, we all have our particular lessons to learn through these things. But if you see this verse, the disciple is not about his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Think of it this way. The teacher is not specified in this verse. We have to keep in mind that there are two different teachers you can learn from. You can either be a disciple of Christ or a disciple of Satan. It is that clear cut. If you're a disciple of Christ, then your training necessarily includes suffering and carrying your cross. But if you're a disciple of Satan, then your training includes everything that we talked about the passage doesn't mean. If you're a disciple of Satan, then that means that you read these things, judge not, anything goes, condemn not, we'll just go along to get along, it's easier that way. If you're a disciple of Christ, when fully trained in his righteousness, that means that you will be like him, in that you will come through the suffering, you will be brought through the suffering by his grace, one for you, and that even though you may die, before he comes back on the second on, on the last day, you will be raised as he was in his glorious resurrection to everlasting life in body and soul. That is what that means. In being fully trained in suffering, being fully trained through death, you will be brought forth to everlasting life through him. And you will be like your teacher, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing. Yet on the flip side, if you're a disciple of Satan, when fully trained by him and all those things that Luke 6, this passage from Luke 6 doesn't mean anything goes, eh, 
leave it alone, it will just go away. When fully trained in these things, you will only be good for tossing into the lake of fire prepared for your teacher and his angels. This is the harsh reality that it comes with rejection of faith. But this is not meant for you. God means for better things for you and for all people. That's why he sent his son to die for you, to face the suffering, to be crucified with your sin, and die with that sin, only to be raised on the third day where the sin would stay dead and buried in the tomb. So because of sin, this world is fallen. It's a dark and dreary place full of dangers and snares of Satan that seek to lure us from, from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Yet we have been given this wonderful gift. We have been given God's word, which is, which is a light to our path. And the word of God was also placed on us in holy baptism. We are now temples of the Holy Spirit. God dwells. God dwells among us. He dwells in us. We keep this in mind every day. When we raise from our beds, Luther says in the small catechism, it's good to make the sign of the cross in remembrance of our baptism. Remembering to be, uh, to drown the old Adam, to drown him in our baptism. This word of God, that is a light to our path, helps us in understanding both sides of things and how they play together. And God's word, by understanding just how sinful we are, and his gospel, that shows us the perfect obedience of Christ for us. Through these things, through that word of Christ, God has made us new creations. And he continually recreates us by daily contrition and, and, and repentance in the promise of our baptism and whenever we gather to be given the Lord's true body and blood and his son. God's word and sacraments are what strengthen us in the midst of our sufferings because they point to the glory that is to be shown to us on the last day, when Christ will come back with a shout and cry of command, calling an end to the sin, death, and decay that we are experiencing now. So trust in God's promise of salvation, and His promise of, of redemption, not only as your teacher, but as, but as, but as your Savior. Trust that he has overcome the sufferings that you would now, now encounter by taking them upon himself and nailing them to the cross where they died and were buried, never to rise again. While he rose, while he rose, Victorious on that third day. So when we read these things, judge not and you will not be judged, condemn not and you will not be condemned. Understand that we can only do these things because God has judged us, not on our own merits, but on the merits of Christ. And he has not judged us. He does not condemn us because instead of seeing us, he sees Christ. And when he says to forgive, it's because we have been forgiven. All this is because God, God our Father has been merciful to us in sending us Jesus Christ. And therefore we can now be merciful. What a gracious and wonderful gift. So don't be afraid of the suffering that's to come. Don't be afraid to call out sin where it must be called out for the good of your neighbor. Because you love them. Because Christ loves you. Don't be afraid of these things 
And don't be afraid of the suffering that's to come in following our Lord and being true to his word. Because he tells us to take heart, for he has overcome the world. He is suffering all for your sake. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.